Episode 9. 2022 year in review and 2023 expectations. In May 2022, MoviTherm Advanced Thermography Solutions launched the podcast, The Thermal Review. The podcast covers the wide world of thermal imaging and automated advancements with a targeted audience of automotive, aerospace, manufacturing, and military and defense engineers. In summary, anyone who's a technical geek or engineer would enjoy this podcast. The podcast covers compelling topics surrounding the science of infrared thermography. It also is the first podcast ever to broadcast in thermal. In fact, that was in episode two, Preventing Fires in Industrial Settings with Thermal Imaging. The live recording switches from both regular uh, visible camera to thermal camera. Some parts of the episode display both camera views simultaneously to compare how different visible and infrared looks. Marcus Taren and Dave Purcell host the Thermal Review, and they leverage over 40 years of combined experience in the infrared space. That's because they're very old. I'm, I'm joking. No, I'm not. We are old. It's all about education, uh, was a quote that was uh, made last year uh, in a press release uh, regarding the, the launch of the Thermal Review. Uh, we love infrared technology and believe there is so much that can be done with it. When you are passionate about something, you love to share it. We hope to spread the word about infrared science and get the world thinking thermally. That was a quote by yours truly. Uh, the Thermal Review aims to become a valuable resource for all things thermal imaging. In today's episode of the Thermal Review, we recap... The key takeaways from each of the 2022 episodes and discuss what to expect in 2023 when it comes to motion vision thermography. Good day, Marcus. Hey, Dave. Here we go again. Hey. Happy New Year. Yeah, what happened? Happy New Year to you. Uh, uh, did I black out? Where did 2022 go? I know. Time flies when you're old. <laughs> 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 so they say, Marcus, tell me about it. No, I'm kidding. Um, wow. What a, what a crazy year. What a great year though. Huh? It was fantastic. Yeah. It, uh, it was such a ride <laughs> for sure. It was such a ride. Yeah. yeah. We, we saw some amazing things this past year. We talked about some amazing things as well in the podcast, which has turned out to be a lot of fun. Yep, um, sure. and, and the feedback that we've been getting from from our audience members, wonderful. Thank you. I guess we should should, should give a shout out. We usually do at the end of the podcast, but right now I feel like I need to say thank you to our listeners uh, for subscribing, uh, for uh, uh, giving us feedback on 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 how the podcast is performing and the topics and subjects that we've been covering, and and also giving us ideas on what what you would like to hear about going forward. So. Gosh, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. We we wouldn't be here with, without an audience, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we covered a lot last year. And uh, again, uh, we we felt that uh, today's episode to launch and kick off year 2023, it'd be good to kind of recap what we did discuss in, in this podcast last year and, and maybe share with you some of the key takeaways. So this, you can kind of think of this episode as almost like a... Uh, a summary, if you will, uh, or or cliff notes uh, uh, episode of 2022. And uh, we started off this last year, launched again in May, the episode one, where we we talked a lot about IoT yep. and and what that means when it comes to uh, remote monitoring. So, Marcus, I'm going to ask you. Uh, first question for today's episode, uh, maybe you could recap for us again, how infrared, well, not infrared, we'll talk about infrared, but how the internet of things is really evolving and changing what, what, what we're seeing in the remote monitoring space. Right. Yeah. I mean, it has been also with respect to our business, uh, it has 
been such a game changer, really. Um, before, we really just deployed PCs locally, and it was not connected to the internet. That was just living on some, you know, uh, you know, some local network somewhere, and, and a computer started to get dusty in somebody's office or, <laughs> you know, switching cabinet or something like this. So now, um, and you know, also from from a from a data visibility and sharing point of view, it was maybe just the plant manager had access to it, and that was about it. And mm. now it has kind of transitioned into. Um, anybody can be on the platform, anybody that needs to know, and you can structure the data and the notification to who needs to know what, right? So it's like maybe the, the engineer wants to know a little bit more detailed feedback on what's going on on a monitoring system of any kind versus the, the C-level suite just wants to get the peace of mind that everything is okay, right? Um, so... IoT has really allowed us to to accomplish that sort of thing, right? It, it really creates that that situational awareness, and really that's a structure the the who's in the know when and and for what reason, right? So that that's really from a high level point of view, I think that's really what what IoT has has done, and also you know the the historical sort of um, data collection there, and uh, just a lot more useful. Right than than before, mm. you know, and it's it's also it has the data has uh, with the help of IoT has kind of helped breach boundaries that way, right? Because as I said before, it was just maybe the machine operator or depending on what sort of uh, monitoring system there was, right, or the maintenance manager or somebody, right? So and, and that you you were creating these little islands of information is what I call them, right? And and the rest of the company was completely unaware of that that information even existed, right? So therefore, the usefulness of having that information was also very limited to the people that were consuming the data and they were just living in their own little bubble. And and, and again, it was in and of itself, it was valuable to that person, but it was most of the time, it was just a single consumer of that data that has been monitored. And now IoT helps us open up that, um, you know, the, the basic, basically being able to, notify um, folks. I, I was about to say broadcast, but broadcast is really not the correct term here because it is not being broadcasted to people that just don't want to listen to the data. It's really just event driven, right? That's the beauty of IoT mm. as well. It's not like you are being exposed to the data at all times and it just becomes this this other distraction amongst the million other things you're doing, your emails and your cell phone and other notifications. It is really just, hey, if you, if something is happening that is of interest to you, then you're going to get some information. And that's so much more powerful than just, um, you know, it's it's kind of like looking at the, you know, do, doing the Wall Street sort of uh, analogy. It's like either you, you nobody wants to stare at, at the stock ticker at all times. It's like, no, hey, when, when this stock goes up by 10%, I want to sell and I get the sell notification. Right. That's that's kind of what IoT has done for the for the monitoring world. Right. Or or I sell my stock when something has happened. Right. In between, mm. I don't really need to look at the stock ticker all day. Like there's no point in doing that unless I'm all giddy and I want to look at it. But, you know, <laughs> so that that I think is, is, is kind of the best way that I can describe what IoT has done for remote monitoring. Right. Yeah. Marcus, that's brilliant. And I love the analogy. Uh, because you're right. I mean, there may be some people who want to be looking at that ticker all day because like you said, they get giddy about those kind of things. Right. But for most of us, uh, we don't have the time, right? We have other things that we're working on or we have responsibilities in other areas. One of the things that you said as well that really stood out to me is this, you know, islands, sensors on islands or, or, or monitoring, you know, on islands. One of the things that I desperately craved for many years working in the infrared camera business was what I called the glue. What can pull all this stuff together, right? What can connect all these various, you know, infrared cameras or other sensors, connect it together and, and then present it in such a way that it's meaningful, that I can make you know, actionable, you know, informed decisions on. And 
and I think of how you described, yeah, what how it used to be with islands. IoT to me is like that glue that I wanted so for, for so very long that could actually connect things. And then as you talked about, again, not necessarily broadcasting, but giving the information to make those informed decisions right? Um, without me having to like be glued to it all the time. Uh, and gosh, when you talk about usability, and maybe we could even share some examples um, as we talk about some of the other podcasts uh, in review um, on how how simple it is now uh, with regards to not only setting up, not only a launching a program, a monitoring program, uh, but but also maintaining, and and then also uh, accessing um, and scaling as well. Oh, excellent point. Yeah, because I mean, with IoT, you can start as simple as a single sensor, right, to a dashboard. Let's say, I mean, you could start. It could be that simple, um, but then easily. Add additional sensors. You like that sound effect? <laughs> That's me adding sensors. Uh, <laughs> sorry, a little punchy today. Uh, but then also, then taking it to globally, right? Additional facilities, additional plants, uh, different di- additional locations. Um, let's 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 go to the next podcast topic. Which so that was episode one, IoT. We, we then, in episode two, talked about uh, very specifically, we, 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 we talked about thermal imaging and how thermal imaging enhances early fire detection or early warning fire systems. But we very much talked about this IoT platform mm-hmm. and how it pertains to connecting thermal imaging cameras for early fire detection. Marcus, maybe you can give us a high-level summary of how not only IoT, yes, but maybe the thermal imaging component as well as kind of revolutionizing this whole early fire detection. Because that was a, not only did we talk about it in episode two, but we've seen just huge adoption of, of this technology in that space. Yeah, again, as part of a remote monitoring system, um, thermal cameras are so much more powerful because if you look at traditional uh, fire monitoring, fire prevention mechanisms out there and solutions. Um, I mean, everybody knows their sprinklers, right? So that's obviously uh, the last resort, right? To, to make sure like if, if, but I mean, to, to, to set off a sprinkler, a lot of damage has been done by fire already. A lot of heat yeah. has to be generated until that, that sprinkler mounted, uh, you know, underneath the ceiling is going to pop. And then whatever the fire didn't destroy, the water is going to do the rest. I mean, you're really just saving the shell of the building really at that point. And obviously not to underestimate, obviously, or not to diminish uh, the value of saving human lives. You know, that's obviously, you know, but, but it's really like at that point, it's really too late to do anything meaningful in terms of doing something about it or allowing any sort of response time. So thermal cameras have the ability to, to, they, they don't detect fires, although they can, but the idea really is where the value comes is the early fire detection to really look at is something getting too hot before a flash point is being reached. And that gives you that valuable, hopefully that valuable time to respond and, and, and address that sort of thing. Right. So, but then the issue is again, well, if, if that system just exists within four walls of some building, and what do you do when you're, you know, sound asleep at home or something that doesn't help you there. Right. So you have to Uh. really, um, expand that again, and, and and IoT was beautiful for that as a solution because it allows, you know, there's the message going out to the fire department if you want to first responders. It 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 sends that that map view, interactive map view that we have that says what's going on, where's the issue, because if you have a large facility and you're not familiar with it, you see an alarm, hear an alarm, okay, great, now you're in panic and trying to find out where did it come from, right? So if you just say okay, building one, well that's could be a big endeavor to figure out where is the issue. Now, especially also because being able to detect fires early poses an issue because there isn't a fire yet. There may not be smoke development. So there is no visual cue where the issue is. So if there's an alarm going off, you don't know. You can't see it, right? Yeah. So now that 
sh has to shift to like, okay, what do we do to support somebody finding the issue? So that's where our, our interactive map view comes in. And with the help of a thermal camera, we can now make the hotspots visible to the human eye and show people where is the issue and, and immediately direct somebody to the right location and, and save valuable time and have somebody do something before it even hopefully turns into a fire in the first place. And that's, I think that's really the key takeaway in terms of um, the combination of thermal cameras and, and an IOT system. The, the key value proposition there is that. Mm, yeah, I, I agree. And we, we mentioned briefly, you know, the, the usability of 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 this this new IoT platform and uh, we've experienced that a lot this 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 past year um with with specific customers and and clients uh utilizing you know IoT based early fire detections and it and it is so simple so much easier than where it was you know like you were talking about before we had to have a, this dedicated on-site server and it was somewhat limited in who it could communicate to i think i mean Thermal imaging for early fire detection has been around for, well, as long as I was in thermal imaging, 20 plus years, right? Yep. But only recently, it seemed that it really started to take off. And I, I, I believe a lot of that has to do with the usability now and how easy it is to pull these sensors together and how easy it is to now communicate effectively and efficiently uh, notifications and alarm conditions. Right. And also the... IoT, the, the, the level of, of management and life cycle management all kind of falls by the wayside. That's often underestimated when, when you deploy mm. a monitoring system or any, any sort of computer based system, everybody is like concerned with what does it do and this sort of thing that, but, but technology ages so quickly and everybody knows this. How often do you get a new cell phone, right? How many updates are being, being pushed for your cell phone all the time, right? Or, or Windows or, or anything. I mean, it, it seems like every time you turn on your computer these days, there's another update, right? Or if you shut it down, right? So, I mean, the reason for that is like, yes, there's a lot of issues. There's a cybersecurity threats. There's all kinds of reasons why these things have to be updated, but also not just the software, but also the hardware keeps aging, right? So a traditional system that that is based on a PC, you have to do, and you have to be concerned with life cycle management. You can't just install your system, it, it is starting to literally depreciate over time because it's losing its value um, if you don't keep it up, right? So mm. hardware as well as software, software even quicker than hardware. But what, what the, the beauty is of this IoT solution is now that all lives now on an offsite server that sits in the cloud somewhere. It's no longer your concern when you when you when you own a system like this, the the only hardware you really have is the sensors and 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 an intelligent gateway, which is kind of you can compare this to, you know, if if you're subscribing to um, your internet provider, you're getting your modem in, if you will, right? That's the only thing you really have, um, or, um, you know, cable TV of your cable TV box or something like this. So that that's really the only thing you have, right? So. All of this is being the, the lifecycle management and worrying about updates and all those kind of things all being taken away. You don't have to worry about this anymore. Your IT department doesn't have to spend extra resources on managing the equipment. None of this is there anymore. And that's what makes it so beautiful. Um, you know, that's all simplified, you know, so that's, yeah, that's, that's why we are so excited about it. Um, and, and no more, you know, oh, the hard drive failed on this on this PC or, or you know, or what, whatever the, the issue is. You know, now you just need um, a, a web browser capable device and you look at your stuff, right? I mean, or your cell phone or wh whatever the case may be. And you're no longer bothered by, by any sort of, um, you know, maintenance issues whatsoever, you know. Yeah. I, interestingly enough, this morning prior to this podcast, Marcus, my computer said, oh, you need to do this update. Yeah. And I reluctantly did the update. But and the whole time that that was processing, I, I was somewhat stressed thinking, oh, I hope everything works OK, that we can still do this podcast recording today. Right. That because there's many times where you'll initiate that upgrade, that update, and next thing you know, everything comes to a screeching halt. Yep. It's not supposed to be that way, but it happens. So it's funny you mentioned that because even just this morning, I experienced that and I was stressed. But also to your point, I mean that when things reside in the cloud, that all goes away. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. 
I don't even have to think about it. Right. I don't even have to worry about it. Right. It and just happens automatically. The hardware and software in the cloud is being updated without you noticing, you know, and it's just going to, yeah. in, in five or 10 years from now, having and an owning that, there's zero cost for that lifecycle management, you know? Yeah. Well, and we talked about this as well this past year about how uh, enhancements and updates to uh, essentially the cloud application, if you will, I'll call it that, you know, they happen instantaneously. And, and again, it's like, I, I don't have to go and do an update to a computer system or install some software. I mean, you can do that still if you want to, but you don't have to. And we talked a little bit this past year about uh, uh, a really cool feature uh, that's available in, in the MobiTherm platform. And, and that, that's the very basic, what we call auto dialer, mm -hmm. which maybe you can kind of contrast and compare again to like what, what that used to be like versus what it is today. And what, what was amazing to me though, is that this capability took like two weeks to develop and roll out right in the cloud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Recapping on that. So again, text notifications are available these days on a lot of systems, right? Um, I, I was just, I just set up for instance with my banking. If there's some issue, I get a text message. It's mo much more immediate than, than emails because I'm always lagging behind by two days, three days on email. So there's no urgency anymore, at least for me. I know some folks may not be as busy on emails and that works for them. But for me, email is just not something that I could call urgent. It's, it's several days lag time typically, you know? So that's, so, so coming from email to text message, text message is a lot more urgent, if you will. And, and you want it to be urgent if you have obviously a situation on your hands. But again, the issue becomes, what if you're asleep? I'm not going to hear text message notification, neither do I want to. I'm, I'm turning, you know, things like that typically off because I'm like, okay, that's not, um, I don't want to be buzzed all night long, right? That's just, just distracting. I want to get some good night's sleep. But okay, so what if you do have you know, while you're sleeping an issue and you do need to know about it. Well, we have built in this um, auto dialer function, which basically is a phone system, a virtual phone system that now allows you to send out a phone call with a friendly voice that says, hey, you know, <laughs> you have an issue here in building one or whatever you want this to say and, and you can type in, it does a text to speech conversion, which makes it super easy. You don't have to pre-record with your own voice mm -hmm. what it says you can literally just type in what the message is, need, needs to be, which is super cool. And you can do as many of those as you want in terms of uh, based on the situation, based on the type of alarm, based on what sensor, under what conditions, under what schedule, for who. I mean, it's like super, uh, you know, granular, the, the way you can control these things. And, and what makes it so powerful is like somebody is actually calling you. You know, and then if you get a call, I mean, that's something, again, from a level of urgency, it's another step up versus just getting a text message again, right? So so that's really a super cool feature. In the old days, I, I still remember I, I've, I've installed a few <laughs> years ago myself a system and, and the customer wanted that feature. And we're like, okay, what's available? We're looking all over the place. And there's there's a few archaic sort of hardware devices that are like, glorified programmable phones, if you will. And we integrated one of those into our system. And I had to, the, the only way for that very model that I had to a chance to program this thing was plugging in an analog phone um, to push the numerical buttons on the phone to program this thing. And it would just beep back at me and I was trying to program and it beeped twice and it beeped, beeped three times. And I'm like, what the heck, what just happened here? And um, <laughs> I was on the scissor lift. <clears throat> And I was 110 degrees in that building and, you know, sweat running down your back and you're trying to program this thing because <laughs> I had to locally plug this thing in. It was just such a inconvenience to put it mildly um, to, to get this thing programmed, you know, and if you wanted to do something real quick, you had to pull out the scissor lift and go up there and find your phone and plug it in and read the manual and, you know, figure it all out. I mean, it was so complicated and so inconvenient. Um, and now we turn that all into this, Hey, one click, you type in your message, 
you, you do two more clicks under what condition you want this to go out, put in your phone number, you're done. You know, I mean, I can do this done. in a minute, right? And it's from anywhere in the world, from any um, web browser capable device, and I'm done. You know, it, it's so convenient, you know? It's so easy. I, I, uh, well, I, I, I kind of wished we could actually do a demonstration of this capability and we probably should maybe in a future podcast because it's almost hard to appreciate until you've seen it. Right. But it is as just you described typing in some text, couple clicks, bam. And then alarm condition is met call comes in yeah. and it sounds beautiful and it works that easy. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Um, Moving forward a bit uh, with regards to uh, episodes from last year, episode three last year was on condition monitoring, which uh, also can leverage not only thermal imaging, but this IoT capability. Marcus, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, another big topic for remote monitoring, for sure. Condition monitoring, What? What? I mean, there's there's different condition monitoring solutions and topics out there. What we really talk about when we say condition monitoring is mostly uh, machine condition monitoring, right? MCM often yeah. uh, abbreviated as such. And um, and it's really the question of, okay, I may have some hydraulic pumps or something and they may they may run uh, too hot. And w- what if I have a leak and the hydraulic oil drops down, drips down on, on, on a hot part and fire can, again, it becomes kind of a blend over from condition monitoring to early fire detection kind of a thing in this case. But <laughs> those kind of things are there or just monitoring you know ele- electrical substations for example right there's a lot of uh, especially here in california they have so many issues with uh, an overloaded electrical grid and an aging infrastructure really across the us on on those kind of things and again early warning systems and saying hey if if there's a you know a switch or, or whatever the case may be um you know if there's a higher resistance situation going on you have a three phase connection one is warmer than the others you know you have an issue there you know and it it may not be a catastrophic failure tomorrow but it might be next week or in two weeks from now so again mm-hmm. knowing early you can then still figure out okay how can we bypass this can we do a scheduled shutdown and 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 also, like, do we have the part to replace it with? Because, I mean, that's really where the where the length of the failure comes in. If it's unexpected um, and you don't have the replacement part and you have to fly it in from somewhere, it drives up the costs exponentially, uh, the stress level for everybody. I mean, the outages uh, all the way across. You, you want to be in the know. You, you don't want to be um, reactive. You want to be proactive. And that's kind of what condition monitoring allows you to do. And we can also, um, above and beyond uh, thermal cameras, we can do a, a number of different sensors that we can integrate, you know, whether you want to measure voltages or currents or, or any any sort of flows or levels or whatever whatever critical condition you need to monitor and, and be alerted about if it's going out of bounds, you can bring that into the same platform. So our um, our intelligent gateways are really what I call sensor agnostic, right? So we can really integrate mm-hmm. pretty much any standard sort of sensor and we can even make non-standard situations work as well with a little extra engineering. But most of, of the industrial world has standardized interfaces these days, right? It's either a simple zero to 10 volts, it's a four to 20 milliamp interface, it's some communication, some Modbus, Ethernet IP, you, you name it. And, and that can be integrated to our um, to our in- intelligent gateway, and that data can be basically transmitted up to our cloud server and then displayed on a dashboard. And you can set alarms and, and, and do all those kind of things. So, yet again, it's it's um, you know the, the the accessibility of the data is there, the dashboards, and and you're no longer tied to some system that only exists um, on the factory floor. It's really anywhere in the world at any time, you know. Awesome. Yeah. And again, to me, it's like, especially for condition monitoring, I mean, it's, it's, it uh, coming from, you know, a uh, background of making thermal imaging cameras, working for a manufacturer, I was always looking for that glue because I would hear this from our customer base and uh, the company I worked for is FLIR Systems, the, the best, you know, the manufacturer of handheld and fixed mounted, you know, thermal imaging cameras, been doing it for over 50 years. Awesome sensors, cameras. But again, when our customers are doing condition monitoring, they need more than just a thermal image to adequately assess the health 
you know, of right. machines. We talked about this in the podcast. Hey, I need to know what amperage and voltage is just as well as just the thermal camera temperature. And so instead of having to do all these separate measurements, again, the glue, IoT, bringing in those sensors mm -hmm. uh, into a single dashboard. So you see it right in front of you. You can make that judgment call. You can make that assessment call. You can predict where you're headed. So again, as you pointed out, you're not having to react to everything. Um, so that breaking down those islands, bridging the gap, if you will, leveraging with IoT, amazing, yep. amazing capability. Uh, moving ahead to to our our next podcast broadcast, we shifted the uh, subject uh, entirely. We still use thermal imaging, but instead of talking about IoT, we started to talk about um, what is called non-destructive testing. And uh, we specifically talked about active thermography. So Marcus, I'm hoping that you can recap for our audience the difference between passive thermography and active thermography and, and maybe touch on how that active thermography uh, can be an effective tool for teasing out defects in whatever you choose. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> um, so most folks know if they even know thermal imaging. I know we always, it's, I mean, we are living and breathing it every day and we sometimes forget yeah. how foreign that may be to other folks out there here listening uh, because we have been doing it half of our lives, essentially. Um, yeah. So we're trying to make it, um, you know, more digestible for people and trying to simplify it and, and, and explain those things. So passive thermography, what that means is really a thermal camera looking at any object that has some sort of a heat signature, right? So it's usually caused by some sort of self-heating. If we're looking at an electrical motor that's running, there's, there's energy losses and those energy losses are being uh, converted into heat, right? Or if you're looking at the brakes of a vehicle that has just come down a hill and it's braking, it's getting warm because the kinetic energy is going into friction on the brake pads and, and on, on, on the brake disc or something, and, and that's created in heat. So most of the byproducts on, on, on any sort of um, physical systems actually converts to heat. Now, sometimes you want the heat because you're intentionally heating something and you want to figure out what's the temperature. Sometimes it's a byproduct and it's it's... Obviously, it's there, but maybe you want to make sure it doesn't get too much. All those kind of things. Uh, you can also, on the contrary, look at cooling. So the point, though, is passively is referring here to the camera just pointed at an object, and it has um, a delta T, a delta temperature in the scene. So we we which is creating then that contrast that makes the 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 the, the thermal image more intuitive to understand for the human for the human eyes or the human uh, mind if you will whereas um usually we're used to with compared to regular cameras we need contrast in an image we need a certain brightness to to make out objects like what's going on to make sense of the scene right mm -hmm. so therefore we call it thermal contrast in a thermal image because the the the, the, the thermal camera um converts a, a a wavelength of light that the human eye cannot detect i mean i cannot look at a motor and just by looking at it, figure out what the temperature is, obviously, because our eyes don't respond that way. They respond to, um, you know, only to the visible range, which, which is in the 400 to 700 nanometer range, whereas thermal, especially long wave, is going to be in the 7 to, to 14 micron sort of wavelength. So it converts this into a visible image for the eye. Now we can start to see heat, which is the phenomenal thing of that technology. Um, yeah. So that's what we consider as passive, right? So something is self-heating. Now, the problem is sometimes we want to look at something, let's say um, any sort of um, thermal conductivity change in a material which could be caused by, um, let's say, a delamination of something, right? So thermal conductivity here means more of a, how does the heat, how is the heat that I put into the surface of the material flow through the material? So if it's a homogeneous material, I put heat in, uh, it, will, it will flow through the material at a certain rate. But if I have a delamination, there's an air pocket, the air poses a barrier for the heat to transfer because it's going to go slower through air, and that slows down that heat transfer. And that heat transfer can then be converted into a contrast again. So it's a, it's a little bit of a 
well, it's quite a bit of a shift in terms of how the the, the thermal contrast is being created. Um, and the active part there is really referring to I am putting heat into the object that I'm looking at actively. So I'm I'm using maybe halogen lamps or or uh, a hot air gun or or something along those lines to create and induce heat into the object that I'm trying to examine because it does not have any sort of self heating at the time that I'm looking at it. In other words, the objects typically are at room temperature. And if I look at it with a thermal camera, there's no thermal contrast. It's kind of like pointing the camera, the visible camera that we intuitively know, into a dark room. There isn't anything there. So it, it, looking at a black picture wouldn't make any sense, right? There's nothing, there's no information there that I can find useful and do anything with. So, but, you know, in, in the dark room, if I turn on the light, all of a sudden now I can see things, right? So it's the same thing with active thermography. I'm turning on heat instead of light. And I'm illuminating the part, and and based on that, now I can measure things, and that's kind of the difference, um, you know, between active and, and and passive thermography. There. Yeah, in in that in that particular episode, Marcus, we had it. We had a guest speaker, we had we, with us, right? I say speaker. Yeah, uh, Nathan from 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 our own MoviTherm team. Yeah. Who, uh, my goodness gracious, essentially uh, runs our. Uh, NDT lab that we have on site mm -hmm. uh, for doing things uh, like feasibility uh, studies, which we talked about in that that episode uh, in, in 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 great detail. Um, for our listeners, um, it, that was a great episode. I I would encourage you uh, to dial in. Uh, that's episode four. If if you're looking at some kind of material and and you're wanting to uh, find potential like delaminations that Marcus just talked about, voids, cracks, those kind of defects, even in the microelectronic space, which is what we talked about in our next episode, which was uh, episode, um, I'm sorry, no, I'm skipping way ahead. That was episode six. In episode five, we had another guest speaker. It's actually Jerry Beanie from FLIR Systems, business development manager over there. And we talked uh, specifically about how thermography is impacting the uh, lithium ion battery life cycle. Right. Maybe you could speak about what we've, what we saw this past year when it comes to, to battery technology and thermography. Uh, yeah. Marcus. <laughs> so batteries, um, are a hot topic in the industry right and and because every device whether it's your cell phone your smartwatch whatever you touch these days is typically battery powered right you don't plug it in anymore i mean a few things you do that are a little bit more power hungry mm -hmm. maybe in their stationary but mobile devices specifically right and it's whether it's your electric scooter like our um <laughs> our intern currently <laughs> is using to get to work <laughs> <laughs> or um that could be in a whole nother episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the adventures of uh, Marco, the intern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, our, our official first uh, company vehicle. But anyways, um, all joking aside, but, um, you know, there, there's obviously, um, you know, electric vehicles, right? Cars, you know. Um, and, and you hear this um, being pumped very heavily on the political front, of course, as well, in terms of mm. like green energy and all those kind of things and switching to electrical vehicles. And then the so obviously there is a, a lot of um, um, a flurry of activity, if you will, on the manufacturing space. There's a lot of new electric vehicle manufacturers entering the space. Uh, new and upcoming existing ones, um, even, um, you know, existing uh, uh, car manufacturers switching more and more over to electric. And then there's also the next level up from there, there's the, the personal drones, right? Where the, 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 the folks that are, you know, we haven't seen this really quite an action in the U S quite yet, but it's coming, you know, they're, they're working through um, certification with FAA, right? Because now they're going to be entering the airspace. You're going to be, you're going to be typing in, in, in you know, in, in your GPS on that drone where you want to go, and it's automatically going to autopilot you over to wherever you need to go, right? But obviously that needs to be regulated. Otherwise, we're going to create chaos in, in the airspace. So that's obviously yeah. from a legislative um, point of view, it's, it's very difficult 
to to get all the thing the, the, the laws have to catch up with the technology right because the technology advances yet again a whole lot faster than 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 what's going on out there and um so anyway but but all of these things are going to be powered by batteries right so with that becomes um the, this huge increase in in manufacturing and, and and research it really starts with the research to get to get more um energy density in for especially for for drones but also for vehicles in a lighter pad battery pack right so the the energy density versus weight is is really the 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 holy grail that they're trying to optimize and optimize and optimize uh, with that comes we have all seen like fire safety because these these um, lithium batteries are very volatile right so they're mm. they're very sensitive to to physical damage you know if, if something happens you don't want this whole thing to light up and and you can't put them out with with water it makes it worse and all those kind of things so there's a lot of challenges there to do this thing and then if you go from from the research into the manufacturing now you need to you need to weld these battery cells together um and the question then is like okay what you know is is the is the welded connection proper because these have an enormous amount of current going through so if you have a poor weld connection you're going to heat up the battery pack and again it could fail in, in its in slightest failure mode, it's it's just not going to have the full capacity that you designed it for because there's too much resistance on the welds. In the worst case scenario, um, it it might catch on fire because something is getting too hot, right? Or something in between where just the battery pack fails or something. So neither one of those situations are desirable, obviously for for manufacturers. They're very frustrating, obviously and dangerous for the consumer. So there's there's um you know thermal imaging uh, inspection opportunities there. Um, where we have done a lot of work as well. And then, then all the way then, okay, what do you do with um, at the end of life for a battery pack? What are you going to do with the batteries? Well, some of them are being recycled. Um, but then again, there's um, you know the worry about them catching on fire because these are being ripped out of existing things. They may come out of uh, crashed vehicles. They, wh wherever they come from, you know, and, 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 and there's the opportunity for shortcutting this if they still hold the charge and you Put a bunch of them into a container they may catch fire right mm. they're, they're unstable you know? um so th those kind of things are there and then there's another you know fire monitoring opportunity right there you want to make sure that you know when you have a big storage area and you have tons and tons of battery stuff there it, it's uh it's a bit touchy it's a bit risky there um so we really have um our solutions really uh for the entire life cycle of of, of battery manufacturing from from the early um, really material science with active thermography, we can help um, companies design that better battery, right? Um, because we can find flaws on, on, on the material science side of things, right? We have, we have ways to electrically and optically and thermally excite these things, going back to the active thermography side of things and then going into the manufacturing, um, you know, doing the battery cell and battery uh, module sort of inspection for, for weld faults and those kind of things and you know stress testing and then all the way to retiring the battery pack uh, on the recycling side so we really have solutions there in the entire life cycle of of batteries you know so that's, that's yeah really that's it if that's uh, that particular episode i i really enjoyed not only did we have jerry with us but it almost uh if you watch the video and uh if if those listening did haven't seen the actual podcast video but we we integrated into it um uh, a lot of uh, graphical um information uh to help uh, explain not only i mean we talk even about how a battery works uh how does it charge how does it discharge we talk about the flow of electrons and in in this case, lithium ions, and how that all works together and anything that impedes that impacts that battery performance that you were talking about, Marcus. But we inserted a lot of graphics to highlight where thermal imaging is utilized along that life cycle, as you just described. So I encourage listeners, if if, uh, if you haven't seen it, you may have listened to it, but go and watch it. it it's almost like webinar-esque, if you will, uh, yeah. in in the graphics that are introduced and utilized in that particular podcast. Yeah, and maybe maybe pointing out for the folks that listen to us on the, on on the audio only, um, you know, you can go to our YouTube channel at, at youtube.com forward slash movietherm, and you will find our video version of of this podcast over there. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Yeah, for pointing that out. Um, looking back, episodes uh, six and seven both focused on uh, microelectronics. 
And in episode seven, we had another guest speaker. Uh, it was uh, Ross Overstreet from uh, FLIR Systems, who's he goes way back with both Marcus and I. Yep. Was actually the the uh, the individual who introduced me to Marcus. Um, and us and, and us that. to FLIR, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, like 16, 17 years ago. Yeah. We are old. He He's old, too. Sorry, Ross. <laughs> um, but, Marcus, maybe you can kind of recap, you know, that discussion about, you know, microelectronics, thermography, maybe passive and active. Right. Yeah. So let's start with the easy one first. So um, let's say, you know, assembled uh, circuit boards, right? So... How do you know they work, right? I mean, you, you can do a functional test, obviously, but w what if they don't work? And now it's like, yeah, if you're an electronic engineer, you can go in and, and, and you have your electrical schematic and you can start troubleshooting. You have typically your multimeter or your oscilloscope and you trace things. And, you know, it, if the signals or the voltages aren't there as expected, you can you can try to narrow it down and do kind of like component level sort of troubleshooting. Um, that tends to be um, quite... Um, time consuming and, and it requires um, a lot of knowledge uh, about the circuitry and how it works, how it's supposed to work and all those kind of things. Um, the, the option, the alternative, one of the alternatives is uh, to do passive thermography, pointing a thermal camera at your circuit, powering the circuit up and seeing what is warming up. Now, again, it is expected that, again, because of power losses, electronic components will have a heat signature some more than others depending on you know how much current and voltage is, is going through them but um you can take um you know thermal images from known good circuitries and have that as a reference image and and essentially then say okay we're going to test the ones that are not behaving as expected and compare them to to the reference image and say hey either that chip is not getting warm at all compared to the known good one therefore it may not get powered or something. It, it gives you a much quicker um, sort of an assessment of the circuitry or something gets much warmer than it should. So those are the two sort of uh, things you can see. And like they say, uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words because you, mm. you look at it and, and right away, you typically see something that, that isn't like the other, so to speak. Um, so that, that would be the passive version of it. The next level up from there, if you wanted to get more sophisticated and more sensitive uh, in terms of detectability of things, you can use an active thermography system and, and it's typically based on uh, a lock-in thermography system. And what that allows us to do is um, we can pulsate, let's say the, the, the power to the circuit or we can stimulate a, an input to the circuit or an output to the circuit. There's different ways of doing this um, and cyclically excite the circuitry or parts of the circuit. Right when you when you have more sophisticated situations going on, and that allows us to get um, literally below the noise floor of the camera, so um, we can see temperature variations that are in the milli or micro Kelvin range, um, and that gives you a an enormous amount of sensitivity in terms of what's going on. I can I can find shortcuts on traces. You know that's passively not so easy because I would have to crank up the current to a level where probably either blow that um, <laughs> shortcut away and literally blow the, the, the trace away because it can't handle that much current before passively I can I can reach the, um, the sort of thermal output that the camera would be able to pick up. But with, um, you know, with an active lock-in thermography system, I, I, I can be much more delicate about those things and actually tickle out those little things and, and, and get hmm. much more information from the circuitry. So those, those are things on the, on the fully assembled microelectronic sort of a thing. Um, but we can also go deeper and, and say, if we're looking at, um, let's say a wafer structure, we can have a probe station go in and check functionalities of circuitries on a wafer, if you will, or a decap chip or a chip that hasn't been assembled yet. You know those kind of things we can do. So there's a lot of lot of different things, um, you know, that are possible with with that. And then a lot of these uh, failure analysis labs love, um, you know, a, a thermography system there. And it's often also equipped with like a microscopic lens, so you can really see down to the micron level even what's going on. 
and again, make something visible that's usually with no other instrumentation you can make visible, you know? So, yeah. I mean, I mean, we have seen phenomenal things where you can actually see cells in, in a memory block on a chip lighting up. So you can actually see where the current flows almost on a bit level through a memory, you know? So those are things, you know, um, they are, they're hard to visualize, obviously, right? You, you can put, certain assumptions forward but it's the most direct way of seeing electrons flow if you will you know without uh, having any other methods of, of making that visible you know marcus the, the 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 thought that i keep getting as i'm listening to you talk about these different applications is uh again you touched on this is being able to visualize what typically the human eye can't see and that's what's so wonderful about this thermography. And I guess that one of the things that gets me so excited about the technology, even though it's like the oldest new technology out there, <laughs> is how it works both quantitatively and 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 uh, quantitatively, right? Yeah. Uh, qualitatively, just as you described, because you see, you see the heat, if you will, or the lack of heat in that you know, qualitative image. It's amazing. Yeah. So you can do this assessment just qualitatively or visibly straight away. And then, hey, you want to get more scientific and you want to do quantitative analysis? Well, there's cameras that are calibrated today. Yep. Yeah. And then when we get into lock-in technology and you start looking at, you know, amplitude and phase shift of how things respond from the heat transferring through things. Oh my gosh, that blows my mind. I love it. <laughs> I yeah. guess what I'm saying just gets, I, yeah, been doing this for many years and, and still very passionate about the technology and what it can do. And I know, well, you are as well. I mean, case in point, the company's called Movi Therm, right? Motion vision thermography or advanced right. thermal, you know, thermal solutions. That's what, that's what we're all about. Marcus, the, the final episode that we wrapped up the, the year 2022 with was ensuring package seal integrity with thermal imaging. Boy, we've kind of crossed the spectrum, you know? I mean, we, we're, we're talking about IoT and fires and condition monitoring of mechanical systems and then, you know, this defect detection and, and electronics. And we wrapped up the year talking about thermal seal uh, integrity. Uh, package seal integrity. Uh, why, why did we talk about that? <laughs> well, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of our focus pillars for our companies. We have package seal inspection solutions, right? Which is really falling kind of under the umbrella of plastic welding, if you will, uh, because you're fusing plastic materials, you know, most likely together. Um, this just, uh, you know, triggered a thought because, you know, if you think about it, how useful a thermal camera can be for all of these different applications, right? It's really, what are we, we we're taking um, an image of a camera and we're solving all of these different applications with it. But that's that's really, I hope uh, folks out there that are listening to this are, are going to be appreciating this because it is it wasn't easy by any stretch of the imagination to develop these solutions, right? So, yeah. I mean, there's pixel information of temperature. How do you make that make sense to your application? It takes a lot of know-how and, and some of these applications that we develop have evolved over years and have been refined over years. Um, you know, and sometimes I see folks out there like, oh, how hard can it be? <laughs> we're just going to buy our own thermal camera and, and, and write our own software. We have some, some sharp engineers hmm. and I'm always looking at this. I'm like, wow, because um, like with every, everything else in life, if, if you pursue on, on something complex and trying to solve a complex problem, there is no shortcutting it. You know, you're not going to shortcut your learning curve. Um, being able to program has nothing to do with understanding uh, physics, right? Understanding yeah. different wavelengths, understanding optics, understanding heat transfer, understanding the, 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 the having the domain knowledge of how that applies to your particular application. I mean, all of those different skill sets you have to have in order to be successful programming yes is one part of it 
but you can program all day long and not get there, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like that's, um, I often see people grossly underestimating what they can accomplish. And and I have several, I'm not going to name names here, but the, I have several um, examples of customers. They come back two years later and they still haven't solved the problem that they thought in the beginning, how hard can it be? And they thought it was much cheaper to develop this in their own house. And they still haven't been able to solve it, you know, and it, it, mm. I still cannot understand the thinking behind that. You know what I mean? Like, why not working with the experts? And w the, the only shortcut you have is to work with people that have done it and, and give you that uh, solution. You know what I mean? That's the only somebody that has the experience and has failed 15 times along the way and has learned from all of those things and has refined the solution. That, that's what I'm saying. Like that's, that to me is always still mind boggling that that thought process still exists in, in, in today's uh, manufacturing worlds. And, and, you know, that's, that's yeah. kind of uh, interesting, you know? Well, Marcus, I, I, that's what you just described is what brought our organizations together. And I say organizations because years ago when I was working for FLIR Systems, again, making phenomenal sensors, but we would talk to customers daily who needed a solution beyond just a thermal camera. And it, again, shout out to Ross Overstreet who introduced <laughs> our organizations, brought us together because you bridged that gap. Movitherm bridged that gap, if you will, for FLIR because you were able to and again, this is going to make it sound so easy, wrap a solution around this infrared camera and create a turnkey solution or, you know, or out of box solution for a customer mm -hmm. who needed to solve a problem that had some way to be quantified and measured via thermography. That's, that's the value, right? That's what, that's, that's what Movitherm brought to the team right? Uh, at that time. And still to this day, um, we're still working very closely with uh, FLIR systems. They make phenomenal products, but again, we're, we hear from customers, you know, who need solutions. So we have solutions like, you know, early fire detection solutions, again, wrapping the solution. And that yep. may, I, I almost hate saying that because it almost, almost oversimplifies it. Cause again, to your point, this was, this has been years in the making, right? Years in the making. Uh, but solutions now for condition monitoring, solutions for, uh, you know, battery inspection at all stages ar uh, across the life cycle um, for, you know, non-destructive testing. Uh, and that could be, you know, composites, it could be electronics, could be ceramics, could be metallics, could be you name it. Um Microelectronics again, wrapping a solution around that versus just a camera. Right. And 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 then yeah, I asked the question. So why did we talk about you know package seal integrity again? There's 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 a market out there. There are customers out there. We talk about it because it's a trend that we see. We have folks coming to us saying, "Hey, can you help? Can you help us with our package seal integrity? Can you help us with our quality? Can you help us, you know, improve?" Uh, customer satisfaction with our packaging. Yep. And oh, by the way, if it's a thermal based, you know, like you said, plastic welding is essentially what it is. But if we could see it with an infrared camera and we then we can measure it with the infrared camera, we can create a solution around it. It's more than just a camera off the shelf. And it's more than just, oh yeah, I can program, as you pointed out. Yep. It's it's 20 plus years of experience coupled with that technology culminating in a off the shelf solution to do package seal inspection, microelectronics, uh, non-destructive testing, you name it. But we talked about these things last year because these are the things that we're hearing about. These are the, the, the trends that we're seeing based upon you, our listeners and, and customers alike coming to us saying, hey, we need, we need, to, we need some help. We need, to, we need to solve this particular problem. And it takes more than just an infrared camera. We're, we're, we're running close on time here, Marcus. So 
I'm going to ask you this tough question. Maybe it's not a tough question, but part of the title of today's podcast is not only a review last year, which we which we just did, mm-hmm. um, but 2023 expectations, and, and maybe it's like trends that we're gonna that we expect to see or thinking that we're going to see in 2023. And if those are trends that we're going to see, they're going to be podcast episodes because that's what we talk about. We, we're talking about what we're seeing in the marketplace. Right. And what we're seeing is trends. So what what do you think we'll be talking about this year? <laughs> um, <laughs> I I predict <laughs> <laughs> that um, we will definitely talk about um, in in addition to continuing to talking about um, you know early fire detection and condition monitoring process monitoring, right? That's another yeah. element where is my process really the way that I'm expecting it to be. Because there's a lot of things where you have single point sensors, but you really are trying to measure an area. Let's say you have a continuous web application, you're drying some material that's coming out and that may be like six feet wide or something. I've, I've seen people using parameters. They may be using one on the left, one in the center and one on the right. And the assumption is, okay, Everything else in between, I'm going to extrapolate from those three points, right? Um, Well, non-uniformity, you cannot measure based on three points. You have to have a lot more. Well, thermal cameras to the rescue because now we can throw 640 Mm -hmm. measurement points across that web, right? So now we have a much more granular sort of a, um, you know, feedback on things like this. So, so I think you know, process monitoring is definitely another element that's that's going to be talked about. in terms of application, um, more specifically, battery is definitely going to be a big topic moving forward. There's going to be a lot mm. of need there, um, you know, on, on that front for sure. Um, it, another s- thing that I'm seeing, and and it's being, um, it's being, I, I would like to even do a whole episode uh, on this is um, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, that sort of thing. I keep hearing and people coming back. And they're so fascinated by it. And I am too. I'm a technology mm. geek. I am fascinated. But I want to tell the ugly truth about AI and that most people do not tell. We have used AI. And there's really phenomenal use cases. And there's great things, great problems that you can solve fairly easily, although nothing is ever easy. But I mean... There's really good matches for AI, and there's really bad ones. And and people are just getting hyped up, and they're like, "Oh, those guys have AI. This must be the best, the latest." And everybody wants the latest and greatest. I get it. When it comes to um, you know, manufacturing quality inspection, right? A lot of these companies, especially in the regulatory world, whether it's you know military, whether it's pharmaceutical, medical, but also general manufacturing, you know, most have adopted by now like a Six Sigma sort of a standard, right? So 99.97% or whatever it is, it needs to be accurate, right? Well, good luck. Good luck getting there with AI, right? Mm. Because it's just not there i'm sorry you're not gonna get there with ai and um, because the very thing that makes ai so powerful is the ability for ai to look at all of these different changing things and make sense out of it the problem is those tiny nuances that is the 99.97 percent if you're tolerant to that guess what? You're not going to be able to differentiate, right? That's that's the very thing that most folks out there don't understand. And nobody's telling you that until it's too late, until you have invested in all of this thing. And then you're like, I'm not getting to the level of accuracy with that that I need to get at, right? And I keep seeing this over and over again. And AI is also as sensitive to environmental changes as anything else so if 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 you have let's say in the thermography world if you have winter coming in and 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 your stuff is getting a little colder and you haven't trained your training set on those conditions guess what 
not going to work for you, right? So um, that's what I'm saying. Like, I would like to do the, it just came to my mind. I would like to do an episode saying the ugly truth of AI, because I, I think we as the technology company owe folks out there to set the record straight. It's being so overly hyped up out there that um, there is cases where it's fantastic and is super cool and, and all of the above and it solves phenomenal. It's mind boggling. Some people are scared of it because they don't understand it and all those kind of things. However, you know, when, when you come from the technology world and you understand how it works, you also understand where it does not work and it should not be applied, you know? So that's what I'm saying. It, it, it is very, um, how I want, it is very seductive technology yeah it's very hyped up you know what i mean but it's it's really not all that um and you yeah. need to be careful with where you apply it you know well to our listeners you heard it here so that episode it sounds like it's going to be coming and it sounds like it makes sense that that's something we focus and talk on uh right this coming year yeah so to our listeners again thank you to our audience for those who uh listen in for those who uh, go to the YouTube channel and watch us there, for those who subscribe, we thank you. And please continue uh, to provide the feedback. Please continue to uh, send us ideas on, on what you'd like us to address. Again, what we talk about here is what we hear and what we see. And um, again, combining that, as I talked about at, in our intro, you know, uh, with all the, the, the experience, leveraging all that experience between us and, and the passion that we feel about this infrared technology, thermal technology. Um, and again, just spreading the word and, and helping the world think thermally. So thank you for that. Marcus, closing remarks. I am super stoked for 2023. Um, I mean, it has been in last year, it has been such a ride and I'm, I'm looking forward to all the <laughs> new adventures we're going to be embarking on and uh you know looking forward to growing our listener base here as well on the podcast i i hope uh, folks really find it uh useful what we have to say because it's it's dear to my heart that we really share our knowledge we educate people out there i i want people to understand this technology you know and and i think uh, the world's going to be a better place when we hopefully accomplish some of this, you know? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Well said. Thank you again to our, our, uh, our listening audience. And until next time, be good. <laughs>